trunk all the time. As I was coming up uh, Hockley Road, which is like half a kilometer from the shelter that I run, uh, I thought, oh no, if I put the, the dealer plate on, hanging out the back of the car. And there was a police officer on the other side, and he kept waving me through, and I'm like waving him through, and he's waving me through. So out of intimidation, thinking I better go up, otherwise I'm in trouble, I should have gotten out, checked my plate, put it on, but I didn't. Drove off the road, there was two lanes, we both could have turned, there was no reason for anybody to wave anybody through. And I went up the road, and uh, I called up my trunk, and I said, I have my plate. And he basically said, well, you didn't when I saw you, so um, basically I'm giving you a ticket. So I intended to fight it um, with the jurisdictional um, you know, identity uh, issues. And when I asked for the oath of the judge and the crown attorney and the police officer, they said, oh no, we don't do that. But immediately that set off bells in their head and realized they realized that this wasn't going to be a normal case. Immediately they changed judges. Ten police officers showed up. I was alone. I didn't have anyone in the courtroom with me. And so being a you know, the age I am and stuff, I really didn't want to go to jail and I didn't want to be dragged out of the courtroom, which I have been before. So I decided that I would just <clears throat> go along with their jurisdiction and try to win my case on its merits. Well, that wouldn't matter. I really didn't do anything wrong, but it doesn't matter. They had me in there. Um, at the end of the, the entire case, they basically said, well, we have jurisdiction, we have the date, we have the time, we have the name, and we have absolute liability. So I'm thinking, okay, it sounds like I'm going to be, um, you know, charged here. Um, during the court case, I had held on to my Bible. I didn't swear on theirs because it says you're not supposed to swear on your Bible. So I affirmed to tell the truth and uh, I, I read the Lord's Prayer. And I said, you know, God's forgiven me for the silly little mistake that I've made and I'm hoping you'll do the same. So um, he said, basically, you're going to be convicted. And I'm like, sounds awful. But uh, he said, do you have anything to say before I convict you? And I said, I just, I just asked for mercy, that's all. So he kind of looked down and uh, then he said, okay, well, we're, you know, based on the kind of work you do and, and who you are, we're just going to suspend sentence. Well, the Crown was not happy at all, but not at all. I said, thank you, and I left. Just as I was about to leave, uh, two of my friends came in the back door of the court and sat down. Uh, one was George Bothwell, which you may have seen on YouTube. He just recently won a case where they did not get jurisdiction over him. He was thrown into jail for I think approximately eight days. But we all stood behind him. He submitted his correct documents and he was free. All the charges were withdrawn and they were pretty serious charges. So um, I left. I was kind of disappointed that things didn't go way I'd expected to. A suspended sentence just means you get the charge, but you don't pay the money. So as we were leaving, because none of them would give their oath or identification in any way, George Bothwell, who's a very strong man, um, he's a farmer, but he's a strong personality. Um, he walked up to the Crown, and as we were leaving the courthouse, we were in the court parking lot, and he said to the Crown, uh, could I have your business card, please? And I had everything tape recorded because I always do it, a little tape recorder taped here. So I had it, that's my proof. Uh, the Crown says, I do have my card, but I choose not to give it to you. So I thought, oh, great, so I don't have to give my ID when you ask me. And that's basically all I said, got back in my car and we left. That was it. Uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, yesterday I did a pounding uh, on the door. Uh, at the shelter, so I'm at my work in front of volunteers and other people that live there, which is very, very embarrassing. We came to the door, Orangeville Police. They were completely out of their jurisdiction because we are OPP area. So they pulled their badges like this, and I'm like, oh, well, I'm scared. Anyways, I was, because it was very intimidating. They were on my property, even though I had a no trespassing sign. Um, and they asked me who I was. Um, I was sort of knocked off my feet because I was concerned there was a family emergency. So I admitted my whole name because I was just ready for them to tell me something serious had happened to someone in my family. I couldn't in a million years imagine that they were there for this purpose. They said, we're here, and Rosemary and Don, who were staying with me, they came out to witness this, and they said, uh, we just want to tell you that you can never do that again. That that crown felt completely intimidated by you asking for his business card and if you do it again, you're going to be charged. 
And I'm like, are you kidding me? You're in my house, at my work, in front of all my friends, and that's not intimidating? But he, what, one of them was a detective, and one of them was the sergeant of the uh, Orangeville Police. They both gave me my, their cards, and I was just absolutely dumbfounded that asking for a business card was considered intimidation. Um, I, I you know, went over and over again, I said, well, first of all, it wasn't me who asked. I don't want to pass you know, the responsibility on that someone else asked. And they said, well, it was your court case, so you're basically responsible for what your friends do. So I wasn't happy with that either. And it just goes to show me that they can go right out of their jurisdiction. Orangeville Police has no jurisdiction whatsoever in the Mono Township, the, the OPP would. How they found me, I do not know. That was not my home address, which is where I think they should have come if that was the case. And uh, Rosemary had a chance to explain a few of the reasons that we are so upset with the way that the police are behaving. Um, this is a perfect example. So I do plan to write a letter to the Attorney General, to the head of the Orangeville Police, and to the Crown Attorney, and ask him how asking for a business card is intimidation over what they put me through. I mean, I, I'm really glad that they didn't uh, arrest me and take me away, but it could go, it could come to that. And I, I feel that this is the reason we need to uh, become more aware of how it's becoming a police state and that there are no rules. They make them up as they go. I mean, who here, if was asked a business card, would consider that intimidation? I don't know. It would be different if I went to the Crown's house or followed him to the shopping center and asked him there. I could see that maybe that would be like I'm stalking him or something, but this was immediately after we left court. And uh, I spent the rest of the day really, really thinking about uh, what we, the people, need to do with respect to little things like this, because it could be you, and I don't think I'm any threat to anybody. And so uh, that's basically my story, and I'm really surprised that no involvement with the law whatsoever. So that's what I have to share, and I'm not sure who's next. So here we go. Thank you for letting me share. energetic right now folks I just went through a bit of a, a spiritual and emotional ass kicking and I'm, I want to share that with you because it gave me a, a huge epiphany <laughs> oh, <too> loud. <laughs> the funny comes later yeah it was it was pretty weird and I ended up doing some uh, some research on the web about it I ended up traveling here with this guy for three weeks I've been traveling with this guy, and he has this very bad habit. It's called, on the web, I looked it up, it's called aggressive passive assertive behavior. And it takes the form of an immediate rejection of whatever you're presenting. He then laughs about it until, because you're uncomfortable or you're in discomfort, he then says, oh, it's just a joke, ha 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 ha, and then he commands you to carry on doing what it was you were doing. I'll give you an example. I brought him morning coffee. You would expect he would say, thank you, Ralph, thanks for the coffee. What does he say? Why'd you get coffee? I prefer tea. I'm like, holy shit. Ha ha ha, just joking. Yeah, give me coffee. I'm cooking, uh, I, I buy and cook a chicken. He says, chicken, why didn't you get fish? I'm like, what the hell? Ha ha ha, just joking. Yeah, continue cooking, cooking uh, chicken for me. It's a pathology and it is recognized as a type of abusive behavior. I got online and there was a whole thread form about this. Guys who would insult their wife, say, oh, you're looking fat and ugly. She gets upset about it. Ha, ah, just joking. Now the beauty about this sort of action is it is nothing but extensive and overwhelming antagonism. And I'm not talking once or twice a day. I'm talking three, four times an hour. Every opportunity he would get. He would just shut me right down, insult me, and then claim, oh, it's funny, I'm laughing, it's just a joke, carry on doing what you're doing. It got to the point, drove me nuts. So I try to deal with it in a logical, reasonable, patient fashion. We go, we sit down, and we're in the pub, I have a beer, I buy him some chips, and I let him know, listen, pal, this is not funny behavior. It's deeply insulting, it's offensive. 
He tells me that's not his intent. I say, well, that's the effect he promises to stop. Then this, this type of bullying, and that's what it is, it's spiritual bullying, starts manifesting itself physically by him pretending to hit me in, the, in my face, backhand me in my face. I'm walking through the door with loaded bags. He turns around, ha, ha gotcha, make you flinch. I'm like, what the hell is that? Who does that? <laughs> he ends up doing that two, three times a day. Luckily, he never hit my face with his hand because that would have cost him. But when he did it once with a rolled up paper, he did hit my face. Finally gets to the point, I've had enough. We are having a meeting and I'm sitting down and I had told him, listen, there's a line. I'm done with this. I'm done with this offensive, insulting, and antagonistic behavior. So we're trying to have a meeting. And I say, okay, let's grab the pen and paper and uh, let's start this meeting. No! What the hell? Uh, just joking. I was, that's it. I'm done with you. I'm done. I threw down the pen and paper. I said, you can't take this seriously. I'm not taking you seriously anymore. All you're doing is antagonizing me. He ends up leaving. I end up kicking him out the next day. He's telling friends, and I've got friends telling me now, that I have to change in order to be a better man. That I have to accommodate his aggressive and antagonistic action. But here's the thing, the beauty of this, the victim of this antagonistic behavior ends up being the bad guy because, oh, you just couldn't take one joke. When what it was, was never a joke, it was a series of antagonistic insults, continuous and incessant. So now I'm the bad guy, apparently, for... Uh, I don't know, for, I'm supposed to apparently become a better man if I accept his actions, if I change so that I can get along with him. And then I realize, you know what, no, I'm not a better man if I just accommodate someone who has that type of pathology. I am not a better man to put, put up with that. And that's when I had my epiphany. This is very much what we're facing with the government. And I am not a better citizen if I put up with the abusive actions of a government. It doesn't make me a better human being. It doesn't make me a better citizen. And these are things that we have to stand against. And my other epiphany was, I wasn't actually at fault. The first time he cracked his stupid little antagonistic joke that he considered a joke and he, he was insulting my spirit, I should have put my foot down. I should have said, no, that's unacceptable behavior, never again. Instead, I said, you might want to think about that. I tried to use logic, reason, reason and patience. Didn't work. The government, the same thing, what they do, they push your buttons until you explode and now you're the crazy guy. And the government does the same thing, they seek to antagonize, antagonize us, they seek to put pressure on us, and then we end up saying, you know what, I've had enough of that, and they get to label us as the crazy people. So I started thinking, maybe dealing with the government with logic and reason and patience, maybe that's just not going to work with these people maybe they like to antagonize because that's how they find their power that's how they find a sense of self-worth is by putting down your spirit in order to feel like theirs has been raised up if we are dealing with the government like that we have to start recognizing that they suffer from a, so a form of pathology that has to be addressed it's not going to be fixed by being uh, reasonable with them. It's not going to be fixed by talking to them logically. And no patience is going to work. They're just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until you blow up and they can say, oh, look, you're crazy. So that's the epiphany I had. Thanks for letting me get that off my chest, as I tell you. It, was, it has been hell putting up with this constant barrage of antagonistic behavior, which he then labeled a joke. Oh, it's all just funny to him. But you know, he has to label it as funny, because if he doesn't, everyone would just think, boy, you're a dickhead. But when he tells people about me blowing up, he crossed the line, that's it, I'm done. Of course, he just tells them, oh, he blew up at one joke. He doesn't tell them about weeks of antagonistic behavior. He doesn't tell them about pretending to slap me in the face or actually hitting me with a paper. No, he just tells them, I cracked a joke and Rob went explosive on me. And you know what? I, I try to be a patient guy. I'm not saying I'm a perfect man. I know we all have issues. We can all try to be better people. And I sincerely work on that. I thought I acted with a great deal of patience towards this guy. But now I'm the bad guy. People are talking like, oh, Rob's a psychopath because he won't put up with extended and uh, incessant uh, antagonism like that. And I get a lot of emails. I've had people tell me I'm a super guy. They tell me I'm, a, I'm their hero. And it got me thinking, and I realized, I am a super guy, I am a hero, I am in fact a superhero guy. <laughs> I am, I have superpowers, I use them for good, right. I have a superhero costume underneath my regular clothes, I'm ready to go at a moment's notice. That's right folks, 
I am naked man. <laughs> this represents my buttocks. <laughs> this doesn't. <laughs> okay, you want a little more honesty, don't you? There you go. I think we all have what it takes to be, you know, more than what we are, but we have to actually surround ourselves with people who raise us up, believe in us, and don't try to continually put us down. And uh, who read that article? I, I had some stuff I wanted to get printed up and passed around in a little uh, uh, package kind of thing. Who read the article in the National Post, that hatchet job? Who read it by noise? Yeah. Was that a brutal hatchet job or what? You know what they said about the Freeman? They're not openly racist. <laughs> what the hell is that? I mean, oh yeah, they're, they're not openly racist, and then they just leave it at that. And in it, they call me a guru. Now one thing, I know wise men, they never claim to be. And when whatever it is you're going to call yourself, you better make sure you're happy with it when you look in the mirror. And I figure if I put guru on a t-shirt and look in the mirror, I see uro. I don't want to be an guru. I found that more than a little bit insulting. And it's all about truth. And there is a fundamental truth that most people simply do not want to accept. And here it is. For all intents and purposes, for, uh, sorry for you who, who don't want to insult anyone who believes strongly in creationism, but face it, we're naked monkeys. We're a bunch of naked monkeys on a great big rock circling an even bigger ball of fire and no one is in charge. And some people can't like that. They can't handle that. They require the hierarchy. They require a sense of community and they need someone in charge telling them what to do because the idea that they're a monkey on a rock surrounding a big ball of fire and no one is in charge, that terrifies them. But here's the thing, little monkeys on rocks surrounding fire. Here's the thing. You are in fact composed of the exact same stuff that composes that rock and that fire. You're stardust. You're a miracle. Your very existence is in fact quite miraculous. You're divine. And if you start accepting that divine nature, then the fear of the, the, the rock and no one being in charge, it's gone. Once I started accepting the fact that I was divine, and not better than everyone else, just aware of my divinity, I started to find there's a lot of people who hated me because I have this theory. People who have rejected their own divine nature hate it if you accept your own. They don't want you thinking you're divine. They don't want you thinking you're better than the government. They want you down and refusing to accept your divinity. Now, who here has filed their Freeman documents? Who here has served a notice of understanding and a claim of right? Studying it. Who's planning on doing it? Oh, there you go. A lot of people, they have had problems looking at a claim of right. They can be very, very complex and confusing. I was helping out a buddy of mine. The, the strongest claim of right I ever saw was written by a buddy of mine by the name of Clint Mitchell. Now, Clint couldn't understand a great big claim of right. He just didn't have, he had the heart, but he just didn't have the mental capacity to follow the law. And it, it was very confusing to him. So I told him, listen, go meditate, lay down. When you figure out what's really in your heart, come back and I'll talk you through the claim of right process. He goes and he comes back 20 minutes later, he's all excited. I got it, I got my claim of right. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I was going to talk you through. Let me see it. So he gave it to me, I read it, I, was, I almost cried. It was the most powerful claim of right I had ever seen. It said, I looked in my heart and I see that love is my law. I have looked at your words and I don't see love anywhere. I can only conclude your words are not my law. I claim the right to follow my law. And that was it. That was his handwritten claim of right. I said, don't even change a thing, just send it off like that. He was facing CRA, he was facing traffic, traffic tickets, uh, and he had some other charges that weren't, uh, weren't too serious. I think they were marijuana related or something. I'm, I'm not sure. But all of the charges went away. No one ever talked to him again. The secret is to find what's in your heart. From in there, then you define a, a reality that you want to achieve. 
Now, the purpose of Freemanery. Some people, uh, I'll tell you, we've been called everything from anti-government, racist, anti-Semitic. Uh, we're zombies, apparently. Ooh, the scary zombie freemen are coming. We're none of those things. What we are, essentially, from my perspective, I see and I am aware of the rights that my grandfather and my father had. And now I see these rights being eroded, but at no point in time did anyone come and specifically take them away. So I started uh, <coughs> studying this stuff, looking right into it, and what I see is what they're doing is they're getting us to voluntarily convert our rights into a privilege which they can then arbitrarily deny at any time because you've converted your rights into a privilege. This scares me when I see the amount of rights that we're, we're losing. As far as I'm concerned, it's not about my rights. As much as it is about my duty, my duty to previous generations who put their life right on the line so that we could enjoy these rights and freedoms, and a duty to the next generation so that they can recognize or that they can enjoy the rights we have. What I found is if you are stepping forth and you're claiming that you're acting out of duty, you have a lot more power than if you step up and you say, I'm acting because I have a right to do this. If you claim that your right is to fulfill your duty, you're pretty much unstoppable when it comes to dealing with people in the courts. Your heart is more powerful than their words. Now, some people don't like how I speak about this. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a, a world and a society, a country, of truly responsible people. People who are responsible for their own actions, people who are responsible for this society, this country, and our rights. And we are the ones who have to hold the government accountable. We can't demand that the government hold itself accountable. It's clearly up to us. Yeah, we're not racist, anti-government, anti-Semitics, or zombies. But what we want is our power back. We want our power back and we want the government to recognize that they serve us. We are not their servants. Now, one of the things that I try to teach is the importance of love and compassion and truth. And it's difficult sometimes, especially if someone's pushing your buttons, it's difficult to be loving, compassionate, and truthful. But bear in mind that when you're dealing with the cops, they're trying to push your buttons. We drove here and we went through uh, Nipigon. We got stopped twice by OPP and Wawa police. We get stopped in Nipigon, 4.30 in the morning. Uh, my buddy's driving, and his, his driver's license requires someone with um, a, a, a regular driver's license that's not expired. The guy with a regular driver's license, that was expired, so the cop ends up telling us that we can't go anywhere, where he's going to escort us back to the Husky, and he doesn't care how long we're stranded there, we're not going anywhere. Now, when he stopped us, he demands ID, I, sh I gave him my ID, he goes and he puts it into the computer and then two cars come showing up. And there's a great big guy standing outside my window. I'm in the passenger seat. Biggest grin I've ever seen on the guy. I thought he was on mushrooms. <laughs> I'm looking at him like, holy mackerel, like, hi. And I, I said something to him, hey, God's peace to you, officer, or something, something like that. His smile gets even bigger. I realized later he was a fan. They knew who I was when they punched my name through the computer when he came running up. We end up going to the Husky, and I'm sitting there for about half an hour trying to figure out my strategy. Eh? And I develop a strategy I figure is going to work. So I call up the OPP, say, yeah, that nice sergeant, he's about a half a kilometer down the road, waiting for us to pull out so that he can come and say, I didn't give you a ticket last time, now I am. I, and he wanted to come down heavy, eh? So I call him up, and I say, send that nice sergeant, I want to have a nice little chat with him. So he comes pulling up, I come out with a coffee here, we want to have a little chat. We end up picking his brain and sharing with him our perspective on stuff. And I came to a realization of what these cops, what we're dealing with here. When we told him, when we tried claiming that we have a right to get out on the highway, exercise our common law right to travel with neither permit nor license, this is what he said. I'll tell you what will happen if people get out on the highway without licenses. Everybody will die. <laughs> Swear, that's what he said. So I end up trying to tell him and trying to bring him to the point where he recognizes that he is enforcing the letter of the law outside of the purpose of the law or the spirit of the law. But his only concern is his liability. If he lets us go and we get in an accident, he's liable. So I thought about it for a moment and I decided to up his liability card. I told him, I, I said, well, I guess I've got no choice but to stay in your town. 
go door to door to door and teach everyone how to be a free man on the land, hold their property under a claim of right and establish lawful excuse to disobey the government and the courts. <laughs> Just get out of town. <laughs> he was like, just get out of here. We're, we're off shift in half an hour. I'll radio ahead. No one will, tell, no one will bother you. He didn't say he'd radio ahead, but he had said he'd radio ahead previously so that if we tried, they were on the lookout for us. Now, bear in mind, we're traveling in a white pickup truck, BC plates, with a blue tarp flapping in the back. <laughs> that is like a red cape to a bull to a cop, eh? They want to know what's under that tarp like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> so we end up traveling down the road and we leave him behind and we're okay. We go through Wawa. We pull into Wawa. I'm asleep. We get in and we fill up. We get some gas. I'm on the phone. There's an OPP officer, a fairly attractive, short, cute little OPP officer, filling up her gas tank. She takes off, takes a look at us, sees the plate, sees the red, the blue tarp, comes back five minutes later with a Wawa cop, great big tall Wawa cop. <laughs> So we end up talking to them a little bit, and here's what I noticed. They come and they, they try to push your buttons. They want to see fear. They want to see anger. They want to see some form of shame. They want to see you responding like that. And if you just refuse to give them any of that, and then you hit them with love and compassion and understanding, they don't know what to do. They were clearly, uh, uh, well, what now? We ended up giving them our names, and they ran it through the computer. I gave them my ID. And the woman was like, you guys are wild. Because when you run it through the computer, it pretty much says that I'm a free man on the land. So they knew who I was. Now they still wanted to look under the tarp, eh? And uh, so the one cop, he says, well, uh, do you mind if we look under your tarp? And bear in mind, these guys were telling us that we couldn't travel anywhere either. We had to park and we had to fix our, our, our documentation so we could exercise our right to travel. So. Uh, they want to look under the tarp. And I said, well, what are you guys going to do for us to help us get on our way? Well, I'm sure we can work. Uh, we'd, we'd be less, more likely to allow something. I mean, it was a very open kind of response. Now, I realized now what I should have said was, it'll cost you. Yeah, how much? I want a hug for each of us. You get a hug from them, then I'd have a story, eh? What happened? Did you get a ticket? Nope. Gave you a warning? Nope. And off with a hug. <laughs> that would be a good story. But that didn't happen. We, had, we told them, yeah, if you help us get on our way, you can look under the tarp. So they look under. One of the guys has a, a, a guitar. He ends up, they want to see that he is, in fact, a musician. So he pulls out his guitar. He's playing guitar to these two cops. They're, they're tapping his feet. They're tapping their feet. People are walking by downtown Wawa in the middle. It's all like 5 to noon. People are driving by watching this guy serenade the two cops. It was hilarious, and they didn't know what to do. So then they're leaving, and I said, well, what's up now? And they said, well, you can't drive without fixing your documentation, but we're going for lunch now. We're going that way for lunch for half an hour. Now, the highway's that way. I had been asleep when we pulled into town. I swore the highway was that way. So they said, we're going that way, and I insisted we go that way. We drove right past them with the blue tarp flapping in the wind. I looked at them, hey, I thought you guys were going for lunch. And they're looking at me like, what a dumb and dumber moment, babe. Eh? <laughs> Ended up pulling into Max, turned around, came back, and they, they had taken off. We crossed paths with one of them, and they're like, oh, no, we're not even looking at you. How stupid are you guys? How cocky? I couldn't believe it. So we end up leaving, we, and we made it all the way back. The point is, when you're dealing with these people, if you recognize that they are testing you, they're trying to see how you will respond, and if you just hit them with the power of your heart, letting them know that you've got love and compassion and you're not, you're a peaceful man, you're not violent, they end up recognizing the power that is within you. Now, I know that this is difficult to, to believe, and that there's a lot of people who you try doing it and the cops just don't care. They hate free men and they want to come right down on you. And the first cop, he told us about some free men who said, you can't do that, fuck you. And then they end up just grabbing them and pulling them out. It doesn't work. They've got the guns. We've got to find a path that is empowering for us, disempowering to them, without being antagonistic to them. 
This path that you're on, it's not an easy path. It involves using a claim of right to establish lawful excuse to disobey these people in the government and the courts who really, really, really want you to obey them. It's very important to them. All their power is tied up in having you scared of them. What they don't want is to be made irrelevant. That's what all bullies hate, is to be laughed at and made irrelevant. Now, what you'll find is on this path, how many people have shared this information with their, with their family and friends? How many people the initial response was outright rejection? That's what you'll get. Outright rejection is step number one. How many people, once they accepted it, grew angry at this deception? I was furious. That's the second stage. You will get angry once you realize the depth of this deception. Now, a lot of people, they end up getting into a quagmire of anger, and they can never get past that, because the next stage requires you to accept responsibility for the deception. And nobody wants to do that. Everyone wants to put the blame on the other people. I didn't deceive anyone. They deceived me. But we let them do it. We let them get away. We didn't tell them, stop right there. We said, oh, well, I'm going to use logic and reason and patience, and it's just not working. Once you get past the anger and you accept responsibility, if you want power over your future, you must accept responsibility for your past. And the more you accept the greater power you will have in the now, and the more power you will have over your future as well. If you can't accept responsibility for your entire life, if you insist on putting part of the blame for part of your life on someone else, you're never going to accept that full level of responsibility. And the reason you want to do that is the moment you do, you lose all reason for anger. There's no one else to be angry at, and there's no sense being angry at yourself. These negative emotions, they stop us from seeing our remedy. Once you are no longer angry, a lot of you will have a growth of awareness where things that you never thought of before become very apparent and you're like, why the hell didn't I think of that before? Because you were angry. Once you do that, once you get to that awareness, you will end up, it, it, it's a natural step from there where you are fully and completely empowered. And when people in the government try to come at you and they try to impose upon you, you can in fact exercise your powers and tell them, no, I don't accept that. And you do it without the response that they're expecting. It confuses the shit out of them. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> they don't know what to do. They're like, oh, I heard you Freeman are bad people. Oh, well, yeah, maybe you heard the wrong thing there. <laughs> I like doing that because what I realized, dealing with the guy in Nippon, we are in fact dealing with a cop cult. It's pretty much a cult where they feel that they have a spiritual duty to protect us from exercising the rights our forefathers fought for. We're children, we can't handle those rights, so I'm going to protect you. It is in fact a quasi-religious ideology and mindset that they see as having to protect you, and that's where they gain their power. They think that if they are our protectors, oh, I'm a big guy now, and that's what they're looking for. It's a cult, cult of people who feel that they have a duty to protect you and to stop you from making decisions because it might harm someone. When he told me, I'll tell you what will happen if we let people out there with no driver's licenses, everybody will die. <laughs> I realized, dude, you have a fear-based, quasi-religious ideology which is supported by nothing more than fortune-telling. I mean, it's going, like, go back a couple thousand years and it's almost the same thing. Well, you, we have to sacrifice a virgin or else the rains won't come. It's like, what the hell, we have to sacrifice our rights because otherwise everybody will die? I couldn't believe that. And yet, these are the people that we've got who are claiming authority over us. Now, what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of the tricks and traps that they use. I, I know you guys want information and points and the pens go nuts and some of their tricks and traps. If you find yourself being pulled over by a cop, I have heard tell that you pulling over for their blue lights actually generates the joinder that they were looking for. And if you read your obligations under the Highway Traffic Act, 
your really only obligations are to slow down and wave the cop by. Go on, go on. He puts on his siren, tries to pull you over. Nope, sorry, no emergency here, pal. No emergency here. Carry on. It's true. It's true, and if he keeps trying it, then you, if he tries tapping your thing where he gets on the PA, says pull over, then you pull over, he comes to the window and you say, there's no emergency here. What's the emergency? Yeah, they, they don't like that at all. Um, if you end up in court, oh, dealing with the cops still. When they arrest you, they want to read you the, your rights under the Constitution Act, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And they ask you specific things. They'll say, uh, I, I'm reading these charges, they'll read the charges to you, and then they'll ask you, do you understand? <laughs> Who here knows what the trickiness of understand means? Yeah, it's stand under, understand, you're accepting their jurisdiction. So when they ask, do you understand, they're not saying, do you know what the meaning of these words are? That's what you're led to believe. What they're actually saying is, do you accept this and my authority over you? Do you stand under my authority? So you say no. They don't like that. They will try to say, well, what, what, what don't you understand? I'll explain it to you better so that you do. And I'm like, what makes you think it's not a choice? I choose to not understand. I choose to not stand under. They then ask one of the trickiest questions I've ever been asked. Or they'll make a statement. They say, well, I have read your rights to you under the Constitution Act. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand? Even a no at this point. Any word out of your mouth at that point is technically consent to go to court and accept these charges. So they get you to have to say no once, and then if you ask if you, they do it again and you say no, bang, they've got you. So when I was asked that, and they're, they're asking, uh, I've read you your rights under the Constitution Act, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law, anything. That's right. Even a no. Anything you say means we're going to court. I'm like, <laughs> she didn't like that at all. She, part of her didn't like it. Part of her, she was like, well, that's clever. You, you understand how it's working. So folks, pay attention to that. If they're telling you, do you understand, tell them no. And if they say anything you say will be used in court, zip your lip. Because the moment you say anything, write, it, write down your questions for later. The moment you say anything, they've got you agreeing to go to court. When you end up in court, if you end up in court, you will find prosecutors, they often have this one little trick, they love it. They will speak to the judge on your behalf. They'll say, Your Honor, what he means is, and then they'll carry on and try to provide clarification for the court. From the court's perspective, you're letting that guy speak for you and you're not speaking up. Therefore, he is actually acting as your agent and you're an idiot. You have to stop them three times. They'll try it three times. You stop them right there. The first time I did, I did it, I told the, the uh, JP, I said, this man is talking to you like it, he's talking to you for me, and I want you to know he's not qualified to do that. If he tries to do that again, he's perverting justice, and I want him sanctioned. And then the JP was like, no, no, he's acting as agent for the city of Vancouver. You're acting as agent for Robert Christie. And the whole question was whether or not I could act as agent for Robert Christie. <laughs> so I said, thank you. I'll take those words as your judgment. He was <laughs> so uh, avoid doing that. Now, one of the questions that we all must ask is how did this state of affairs come to be? How have we lost so much of our rights, so much of our power? They use tricky words, of course. Who here is in possession of government-issued ID? Now, the government issued you ID, thus they provided ID. But believe it or not, they can provide ID and not issue it. The term issuance, to issue something, has enormous legal ramifications. And you have to look at that. It's not just government provided. It's government provided by way of issuance. When I was in the army, they issued me ID, and then I had to show this issued ID to get my uniform. Because I was issued ID, I was under the authority of the issuing party. They could make orders upon me, and if I refused to accept those orders, I could go to jail. What they're getting us to do is to imagine we have a servant in our house. It's our house, we have a servant, and we tell our servant, go get me some water. And your servant says, here, you must fill out this application, and I will issue you some water. Would you do that? 
It's ludicrous. You're now under the authority of your servant. You say, screw you. I'm placing a demand upon you. You will provide me water without issuing it. Because here's the thing. If you're in possession of something issued to you by the government, do not be in the least bit surprised. What I see it legally, they're placing chains on you. Very softly, very carefully. And they're not tugging on those chains yet. But trust me, sometime in the future, they will. And they'll come to you and say, oh yeah, you have government issued ID. Here's your government issued uniform. Here's your government issued orders. And you're going to say no. And they're going to say, come with us. You are under the power of the issuing agency. Always. That is a very deceptive little tool that I think they're using that allows them to get our rights. We voluntarily convert them into a privilege. And now we're under the authority of an issuing party. And this is where it's getting bad for all of us. We're adults and we go and they, the cops or the government comes and they tell us, you must do this. And we say, why? And their only response, because I said so. Because I'm a cop. Because I'm the government. Because I said so. There's no logic, no reason. They're conditioning us merely to accept their orders. And they have a right to do that because you're in possession of something issued by the government. You really have to look at the word issuance. You have to look at the ramifications of that word. You will find that you are under the authority of the issuing party. They have pretty much carte blanche when they want to exercise that authority over you. They can, they can revoke it for refusing to uh, uh, follow orders. And if you're in the military without even being aware of it, they can actually throw you in jail for refusing to follow the orders. And they don't have to provide this. When it comes to driver's licenses, why the heck do we need something issued to us if all we're doing is establishing competency to use the highways, we're establishing the fact that uh, our, our identification card, we could demand it, they provide it without issuing it, and they have no authority over us, they're still our servants, because they provide it based on our demand. But the moment we demand, and then we fill out an application, and they issue, they've just turned it all upside down, and now you are clearly legally under the control and the command of the people who are supposed to be your servants. That's how your public servants have twisted this all around to get you to a point where you are subject to their orders and commands. And that's why they can say, do this. Why? Because I said so. Because you are holding something issued by an issuing party. The fact is, if we knew that prior to it, if we were aware of this stuff, if people were teaching this in high school, no one here would accept an issuance. No one. You'd be looking at it, you're out of your mind. Give me what I'm demanding. Give me my documentation. Provide it without issuing it to me or claiming to be an issuing party. That's one of the trickiest words that they use out there. When they provide by way of issuance, they are claiming authority over you. Now, one of the things that I see happening... I'm sure we're all aware of it. There's a growing sense of consciousness, a growing sense of oneness, and the, the government seems to be cracking down, and they want, they've got 95% of the power, or 95% of the money, now all they want, it seems, is more power. They want power, they want control, because that's their drug now. They've got the money, that doesn't work, let's get a new fix, and it's all about power and control. The problem is that the, we have allowed, we are to blame for this. Let's let there be no doubt. We are to blame because we have allowed people in power to get it to that position of power and there's a, a great big revolving door between business and government. And the people come and serve in the government, then they go serve in business, then they come back to the government. And you know darn well that when they're in the government phase, they're actually serving the business that they're going back to. The problem that I see is the world can basically be divided into two types of people. Those who think the world can be divided into two types of people and those who don't. <laughs> the havers and the beers. Some people, in fact, they don't care about being anything. If you ask them, what are you going to be? Well, I want to be a lawyer. Why? Do you care about justice? No, I want to make a lot of money so I can have a lot of things. We are dealing with people who, for whatever reason, assign the level of their self-worth is a function of how much they have. And here's the funny thing about havers. They assign more value to something if they have it and you don't. The moment you have it too, oh well, I don't want it anymore, you've got it, I've got to go have something else. And that is in contrast to the beers. 
People who just want to be a musician, not because they want a big bus, just because they love music. People who want to be a doctor, not because they want the, the uh, social standing, but because they want to help people. The world, in fact, is... I, I see kind of a war happening between the havers, the people who want to just have stuff and will do anything in order to have it, and the people who just want to be and who are willing to sacrifice and say, you know what, I don't need a big screen TV, I'm happy playing guitar. Willie Nelson did not get a bus because when he started off doing music, he said, I'm going to play guitar until I get a big bus. He started doing it because he was passionate about it and because he was good at being a musician, then the abundance flowed to him. The theory that I have is that the whole have or be is partly a function of the game and the game that I call it or the name that I call this game, it's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. It is the tool that the, the, the havers use to subjugate the beers. And it's called, look here, not there. Look here, not there. The here that they want you to look at is always their words. Their Torah, their Koran, their Bible, their criminal code, their statutes, their regulations. Always look here. Because they created these words, they have a greater understanding of them, and they want you paying attention to this. Because they're like magicians, and the moment you're focusing on this, you're ignoring this over here. And the there that they cannot have you looking at is your own heart. Your own heart has within it words that God himself has written on it, which totally supersedes all of their words completely. <coughs> They have no power over you if you are holding on to the love in your heart and you're looking at that as your truth because they can't write on your heart. Only the Creator can do that. Only you can do that. So if you have something written on your heart and you are bringing that out, they have no power. That's why they always need you to pay attention to their words and accept their interpretation of these words because then they have power over it. Whereas if you say, you know what, forget all the words in the world, because the way I think about it, if you have to read anything in order to become truly free, then that means freedom is not available to the dyslexic and to the illiterate. And that's not the case. Everyone has within them, within their own heart, a certain thing that they can bring forth and will empower them. The trick to it, what, I, what we're trying to achieve here is more peace and abundance. Is that correct? We want some power, we want some peace, we want abundance without being milk. The secret to it that I found is to identify within your own heart your own passion. Whatever that passion is. If it's justice, that's it. If it's music, it's that. If it's poetry, it doesn't matter what it is. It will be something that is beneficial to your fellow man and it will be something that makes you feel good when you share it. Find that passion, share it freely. You will find that the world starts to magically unfold so that you do enjoy abundance. You will find yourself surrounding and attracting to you people who are into their passion and are into sharing it. Now I know as it's woo-woo way down the line, I'm talking about the kingdom of God, but just imagine for a moment if everyone here just followed their passion and was willing to share freely and openly and evenly without trying to be a have or without taking. People who love growing potatoes, and believe it or not, there are people out there who simply love growing potatoes. They will grow a lot of potatoes. There are people out there, believe it or not, like making french fries. They will make the french fries. There are people who, well, all of us, like eating french fries. I'm not saying that it would end up being a big utopia and everything would be free. I'm sure that it would be necessary for us to engage in exchanges because there will be people who will come and try to take advantage of that. But if we get to a place where you are actively identifying, working and building your passion and bringing it forth to share it with people, you will find yourself off this little rat race treadmill where you're doing a job you don't like so that you can make enough money to pay rent and live in a place you don't like because you feel you're compelled to do that. You will be empowered to find your passion, bring that forth. And, dude, look at me. I'm an idiot. I'm an asshole. Ask anyone who knows me, really. And yet, I'm at this point where, I mean, folks, I have spent thousands of dollars trying to find that right combination of drugs that would silence the voices in my head. And now here you people are paying the euro. <laughs> I'll 
you have to do is bring out your passion and care and share. You like that one? <laughs> I'm trying to keep some funny in there. Uh, fun times, fun times. Now, who here has heard of um, the Canadian Common Corps of Peace Officers? Rob's very cunning plan. One of the things that I have found is in the Criminal Code of Canada, they define, and this was another thing that they mentioned in the, uh, in the, in the National Post, where they say, oh, they're going to start their own police force and start arresting police officers and whatnot. That's not the case. If you look in the Criminal Code of Canada, they define a peace officer. They define a peace officer as any person hired to preserve and maintain the public peace. The fact is, I can hire you to preserve and maintain the peace, and suddenly you're a peace officer. And now, what makes this so good? From a, uh, from a fundamental uh, psychological level, when I first made my oath and became a peace officer, the next three days, it was quite amazing because I felt like I had finally grown up. Things that were, were otherwise might set me off and get me angry, I was like, nope, got to be at peace here, got to be a peace officer. I was like, I, I felt pretty good about myself there for like three days. I was, I'm in charge. So you get that. You start recognizing, you know what, I'm no longer a, a baby needing to be babysat by the government or by the cops. When you go to court and it's you against the cop, it's essentially a babysitter versus the baby. So you can argue and whine and cry all you want about your rights, about I want to stay up later, and he gets to say, I'm merely doing my duty. And because of that, he wins all the time. Now, as a peace officer, you can fulfill your duty. And you can go when, if you're in court, sorry, it's just two peace officers. So now the judge cannot automatically give the other guy's words more weight than yours. When you're talking to a police officer, it's unlawful for you to lie to him, but he can lie to you all he wants. Are you aware of that? Complete bull, isn't it? But if you're a peace officer, empowered by the people of Canada to investigate police officers at any time, then when they come talking to you, now it's you investigating them, you're perfectly free to lie to them right out your mouth and just uh, investigate them. And if they lie to you, well, they'd have to know you're a peace officer, but they'd still be able to lie to you, but if you lie to them, you can say, hey, I'm a peace officer, I was conducting an investigation on the abuses of the police. You will have the power to go in front of a uh, judge, swear out information as a peace officer concerning these cops. Done properly, they have to give you a warrant for the arrest. You can then go arrest them. This is what we have to do. They do not have a monopoly on preserving and maintaining the public peace. And oftentimes in Vancouver, film crews will hire peace officers. 50 bucks an hour, 60 bucks an hour they pay. And they're there off duty, but in uniform, big peace officer sign, and they get paid for that, you'd be able to do that because it only says they have to hire peace officers, not police officers. So there'd be some money there. The cops aren't going to like it because it evens out the playing field. Now, you wouldn't be a policy enforcement officer. You're not going to be a police officer empowered to enforce the crim or the uh, Highway Traffic Act or any of the government policies. Only the Criminal Code of Canada you would be empowered to enforce and against the cops when they're trying to enforce the statutes. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's the remedy against a developing police state where the police think that they have all the rights and powers to order us about. We have no say in the matter. And if we don't do exactly what they say, they get to charge us with obstruction of justice. I've had cops threaten to arrest me for obstruction of justice for failure to do their job or failure to produce government-issued ID. Yeah. Now, they didn't know I was a freeman at the time. But here's the thing. When you look at that section of the criminal code, there's actually two parts, and the obstruction is the second part. The first part is perversion of justice. And to threaten to arrest someone for failure to produce identification they have no obligation to have, that's perversion of justice. And you could immediately arrest that cop right there and say, fine, I'm arresting you for perversion of justice. Now, of course, this is going to lead to a bit of violence, probably, <laughs> unless we deal with it properly. Um, where's Barb?